Hi there, friend. My name is John Verner. I used to be a part of the largest cult in the United States. After studying the Bible, Christian history, and ministry, I set my sights on confronting the problematic nature of white evangelicalism in the United States. In 2019, I published my first book as a first step in addressing the subtle issues of this complex system. This podcast will continue that work under the same title. Welcome to The Cult of Christianity. On today's show, I have Rachel L. Roberts. She um, she studied philosophy of religion for her undergrad and uh, has her Master's of Theological Studies degree from Perkins School of Theology at uh, Southern Methodist University. She's the author of Confessions of an American Nun, a credo of sorts. It's one of my new favorite books. Rachel, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Thank you, John. I am excited to be here. And I also would like to point out uh, sooner than later that the nun part in the title of my book is spelled N-O-N-E and not N-U-N because <laughs> I am yeah. definitely not one of the latter. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good clarification to make. American nun meaning uh, when you fill out a form and they might ask your religious affiliation, you would check none correct that's exactly right awesome yeah it's a great book i really enjoyed it and uh i feel like i got to know you a little bit through the book but uh for the listener what could you as briefly as you can or take your time with it whatever happens happens um what did the first 18 years of your life look like from the outside a show It was a circus. It was it was really it was a it was a circus. Um, but and at the time, you know, a, a a good psychologist would probably you know want to un you know unpack and unravel a bunch of things. But I've reached a place now where I look back and I'm like, that was crazy. You know, um, I grew up in a Christian cult. Um, I always like to to qualify that by saying it wasn't one of the sexy ones. You know, we didn't like sacrifice chickens and marry off child brides. Um, but, um, and when I say sexy, I mean, you know, the salacious kind. Um, but it was very much a cult. It, it definitely met the criteria for a cult and it was part of what was called the shepherding movement that kind of came to the, came to existence in the 1970s and through the eighties And, um, and so it was the experience basically of religion being a very oppressive tool that, um, ventured into all forms of abuse and terrible, toxic ideas, uh, that need, you know, took a, that's taken a lifetime to unpack and, you know, re put things back together. So in many ways, my my experience growing up for the first 18 years of my life is no different than just about any other person's experience growing up because we all have dysfunction in our families of some level or the other and um, so forth. It's just I had a very exaggerated experience. Exaggerated is a is a good word I think for a lot of people who who maybe grew up in some in some wacky religious. Um backgrounds so so when you say you grew up in a christian cult was it a particular church you said it was part of the shepherding movement how what did it look like the shepherding movement i like to describe it as the amway of christianity because it was structured in the classical pyramid type of structure that you experience in those multi-level marketing companies where you have a few people at the top that benefit from all of the work of the people beneath them. And this played out in the shepherding movement in a variety of ways. It did play out financially in that way because the whole idea of the shepherding movement was that each individual person had to have a shepherd to basically be their conduit to God. And so you had like the the lowest level uh, members of the congregation that would have a shepherd 
And then those shepherds had shepherds and those shepherds had shepherds and it kind of worked its way up to the, to a pyramid at the very, very top. And all of the people at the bottom tithed up. Well, so the tithe went just one tier above you? Well, yes, but if you have, so if you have a shepherd at the very bottom who has, let's say, 10 people, quote, underneath him that are giving 10% of their incomes to him, then he's giving 10% of his income to the person above him. So by the time you get to the very top, the people at the very top are making at least a portion of all the people's income below them. Gotcha. So, I mean, in some sense, it's kind of like just cuts to the chase <laughs> with uh, with tithing a little bit. Like, here, let's just do this in a way that, that makes all these leaders money. Was it at all subtle or hidden or was it bathed in Christianese, I guess? Or was it, uh, did it feel like you were going to a normal church or did it feel like you were part of something different than other churches? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just having a laugh at that because the first thing that comes to mind is, well, define normal. <laughs> sure. Um, but um, I mean, at the time, I didn't know any different because we, as I describe it in my book, you know, we, we were this little bitty band of ignoramuses that met in a little tin can building in the middle of the piney woods in Louisiana. And that was the epicenter of the universe to us. You know, I didn't know there was a world out there any bigger. And so that was my normal. And had it not been for the fact that my mother was divorced from my father and she had remarried my stepdad at the time who was in this church. Um, my dad was actually an atheist and they had married very young and divorced very young. And so it was only when I would occasionally see my dad growing up that I even had a sliver of an idea that there was another way to understand reality. Wow. So, so as best you can remember, you're growing up in this environment. Did you? How did you view religion, spirituality, the secular world kind of maybe as a teenager? Were they were they clear cut in your head? Was it all the same thing? Were there hard lines between, you know, us and them? Uh, what was your thinking at the time as a, maybe like a teenager? Well, it was very black and white, which is the type of thinking that is used by dictators to program, you know, their followers. Uh, you know, we good, they bad, you know what I mean? That type of thing. And, um, and there was no room for gray or n nuance or subtlety. And so, yeah, it was all about, we got it, you know, our little group over here, we've got the corner on the market of God and the, the nature of the universe and so forth. And everybody else, else out there are just heathens. and. So even my, like the funny thing is my grandparents, my mother's parents were Baptist and by many people's standards, that's, that's kind of far out there with their beliefs. Uh, but the cult that I grew up in thought that they were just way off the mark. It's interesting how that happens, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, I grew up in a pretty extreme, um, reformed environment and, mm -hmm. uh, Reformers are like, oh, yeah, most Christians are still like not Christian enough. Like, it, it's kind of crazy how the us and them is almost like an, a, a, I feel like sometimes cult leaders uh, get like addicted to that rhetoric. You know, they're so used to us and theming, they don't know when to stop to the point where it's like, are we the only right church on the planet? Because you kind of mm -hmm. make it sound like that sometimes. Well, it's a psychological prerequisite to have people blindly follow you. You have to paint that picture. Right, right. Otherwise, uh, it's harder to, to control and contain them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so how did your views change and, and how many times maybe as a young adult when you're, you know, first leaving home or, or whatever? Well, so I, I left home uh, when I was 16 years old. And that was me leaving my mother and my stepfather in the cult to go live with my atheist father 
And it was the scariest thing I had ever done in my life because I firmly believed that I was rebelling against the God of the universe to, to leave my home of origin to go live with my atheist dad. So I was scared to death, but I also knew that if I stayed in that house, I was likely going to die. And it was fortunately, it was, I was brave enough to, to take that leap and to leave. And, uh, when I went to go live with my dad, I went from Shreveport, Louisiana to Austin, Texas, and, you know, talk about (laughs) differences of cultures. Um, when I got to Austin, I mean, my eyes just opened, my heart opened, and I saw this wide diversity of humanity and fell in love with life finally. So it it was, I've always joked that I want to write a book called uh, How I Learned to Love When I Quit Being a Christian. Yeah, I can. um, Traveling does a lot. Just, Just that move alone, you know, will when you're around different people um, than you, you know, grew up with or are used to, it definitely has an impact on your, on your psyche. It's interesting that you, um, that you were, you were afraid you were, were you afraid you were disappointing God or were you more afraid God was going to punish you or was it a bit of both? I was afraid. I mean, I, I was mostly afraid of being punished, which is a reflection of how I was raised. But I, I, there, I was also afraid of, I guess, disappointing God because I genuinely wanted to do the right thing. And I had, before I left my, my mother and my stepfather, I had literally gotten on my hands and knees and just prayed and prayed and begged God to show me a sign and send me a sign. Should I leave or should I stay? And, you know, um, I know there's a song there, and if I was a singer, I'd sing it, but uh, you know the song I'm talking about, right? <laughs> should I say, should, should I, I go? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> should I stay or should I go? Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I, nothing, you know, it was like, it was like speaking just into a void. I, I got, you know, I was expecting, you know, an angel to appear with playing a harp or, you know, even a warm, fuzzy feeling in my soul or something like that. And it was, it was one of the deadest moments of my life when I was with every fiber of my being beseeching what I believe to be the maker of the universe to give me clarity on this, this decision I was making to save my own life. And when I got absolutely nothing in return, I I, I didn't quite know how to process that. And the, the only way I knew how to process it was to kind of get angry, honestly. And of course, now I look back on it and I have a different perspective now than I did then. But at the time, it it, it kind of made me angry. And then I realized it was better for me to leave and and risk that this God would punish me than it was for me to stay and know that I was probably going to die if I stayed there. Yeah. Talk about a rock and a hard place. I mean, um, and I think there's, there's many of those moments in, in all kind of becoming an adult stories uh, at each plot point, you know, there's like the society tells you you're an adult, then you actually are, learning how to be an adult then i feel like there's another point where you're like oh now i really need to become an adult (laughs) um i think there's a you know these big moments like that but religion uh makes it or religion but but specifically christianity really makes it a personal battle with this supposed guy in the sky that you're going through um which can be really intimidating and and genuinely scary yeah so but you went and studied religion so what was some of your motivation in that well, I had been, you know, properly effed up by religion. So, you know, <laughs> I, um, I, I wanted to figure it out. And I guess it was a combination of me trying to disentangle my own experience with religion 
uh, with just an intrinsic interest. And so, you know, because there were other people and other kids that grew up in this same um, system that I did who did not go, and to my knowledge, of all the kids I knew in this same group, uh, I'm pretty sure I'm the only one who formally sought education in, in this er- area. So I think it's a combination also of just an, just an interest that for whatever reason I was born with, I guess. More, more interest. And was it kind of um, divorced from like any faith you had or was it still kind of entangled in it? Um, or to make the question even clearer, like, was there a specific point when you left the house that you were leaving faith or were you not quite leaving the faith yet? That's a great question. And I, I liken my relationship to religion over the years as like having a bad boyfriend, you know, just someone you can't quite quit. You know, we'd break up, get back together, break up, get back together. You know what I mean? And, um, so I never, I, at the time when I went to my undergraduate, I actually just was done with, with religion. And I was studying it purely from an academic perspective. And I didn't even really think in spiritual terms or anything. I just was seeking head knowledge. And then throughout most of my 20s, I did a lot of self-study with different religious traditions, you know, reading a lot of different books and different philosophies and worldviews and things like that. And um and then in my late twenties, I decided that maybe I had been exposed to this social justice version of Jesus. And I thought, well, maybe I could make peace with Christianity if I try the liberal Christian route. And so that's what first brought me to uh, SMU uh, with my theology degree, my master's degree. And, um, but then that didn't fully work either. And I still kind of toyed back and forth. Uh, I ended up going back to a Baptist church and tried a little bit of evangelical Christianity later. And, um, so it was a, it was an on and off again relationship for quite some time. And I didn't actually get to finish my master's degree until 12 years after I started it, uh, due to a marriage and divorce and having kids and all that. So when I finally finished my master's degree, I, it was at the conclusion of that, that the Pew report came out in 2015 that highlighted the rise of the nuns in our country and that they were a unique breed of quote unquote spiritual people because they, they didn't even select the, the moniker atheist or agnostic. They said, None. Like, don't put a label on me. It's basically an anti-label sentiment. And that's what I realized the space I was in is that I considered myself spiritual. But I don't want to label it because it's it has very little to do with religion. Well, not very little. It's been informed by religion, but it's not religious. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I talk about this concept actually a lot. Um, The idea of being, you know spiritually inclined or whatever um but not religious and i think i mean most of history has been spiritual uh most people in most parts of the world it's just looked different through religious um you know structures and so yeah it's 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 almost um it, it can be it can be lazy or reactionary to just say well there must be no god you know that could be this the easy route to go um to be like, well, if the evidence is good Christians, I don't see good Christians, so God must not exist, you know. Um, but that's a that's a really um, uh, short sighted, in my opinion, way of looking at it. If someone wants to look at it that way, though, go ahead. Mm-hmm. I <laughs> I have no problem with people taking shortcuts. Uh, sounds nice. I would love to do it that way. Um, that's interesting. It would be really interesting to read like uh, papers from your uh, first uh year you know to to your last year get working on your masters and see how uh 
how you wrote differently that would be that would be interesting to see um since you know you were going to to different churches and and feeling different things was there a point where you like all right now i now i'm a nun like now i now i know this was there was there any uh defining moment there or was it more gradual no there was a defining moment there because while i was in while i was finishing my my graduate degree I was teaching adult Sunday school at a very, very large Methodist church here in Dallas. And I was writing papers and in school. And here's what I began to observe about myself, John, was that I could write a really good paper and I knew what to say. Like I knew how to make clever arguments you know, apologetics. I knew how to do the whole, like to, to, to use the Christianese, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and then I realized I'm just performing. This is just a performance. And, and then I started realizing that I was teaching this adult Sunday, these adult Sunday school classes at this church. And I started kind of infusing some of the things concepts and the things that I had learned from studying Buddhism or Taoism into the, some of the Christian stories and the, the, the reception I was getting from the people in these adult Sunday school classes, their eyes would just light up and they're like, Whoa, I've never thought of it that way. And they're like, that makes so much sense. And so I started observing that I'm secretly teaching Buddhism using a Jesus story, but I didn't consider it incompatible with the teachings of Jesus. If you understood his teachings from a metaphysical perspective, like in the gospel of John, but, but I started feeling disingenuous and I was like, I don't think I can keep doing this because I'm not being authentic to myself. I'm not able to openly talk about the influences that have helped me understand some of these spiritual stories, nor am I being respectful of the institution that I'm in right now, because this is not the way that they would classically be teaching these stories. And so it was right when I was starting to understand this about myself, that that Pew report came out. And I'm telling you, who knew that reading like some big study from the Pew Research Center would be this earth shattering experience. But that is what happened. I read that report or the at the time, the executive summary at the top. And when I realized that there were literally millions and millions and millions of Americans in the same space who were like they've had many different influences in their life from a spiritual perspective, and they didn't necessarily they were not necessarily atheists. They just simply didn't identify with a particular religion and they didn't want to be labeled. And I was like, that's me. And that's when I realized I'm a nun. That's awesome. Um, you know, that, that, that story excites me because one, it's actually, I, I, I relate to some of it. It's kind of validating, um, you know, uh, one of the plot points in my departure from Christianity was getting divorced and, um, you know, in that time, a person was asking, you know, how could a good God let all this bad things happen to me? Like, you know, <laughs> like I was clearly going through so much. And I just started mouthing off about, you know, um, Adam and Eve and original sin. And I just started talking and then I stopped mid sentence and I just went, I've been programmed. Like it was just such this it, clear moment of like, what am I doing? Like, I'm not even thinking right now. I'm just saying what I've been told to say. Exactly. And that mo- those are really huge moments. Um, it was definitely a big, big moment for me um, and an important one. But yeah, I, I know what that's like, though. You know, I, I played in some worship. Uh, I led worship at a couple churches after I stopped being a Christian just to get paid. Uh huh. You know, and I've I've preached sermons that I didn't believe, you know, <laughs> like I've done that before. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, it's it's a very you do kind of feel that like guilt from both sides. Right. Where you're like, well not only am I like kind of uh, I don't know, not being as authentic as I I would like to be. I'm also not really being that good to these people either. Um, Mm -hmm. 
so yeah, that's that's very relatable, I think, um, for people who you know were kind of steeped in this. Um, thank you for for telling me all that about yourself. That I think that really informs um, you know the listener for for the conversation you and I are going to have um, about this whole idea of community, right? Mm-hmm. So unity is not uni- uniformity. That's one of my favorite phrases, right? It's not. Um, it's not every person being a car- carbon copy of each other, but but it but it's not wrong to have like a structured subculture or like a, a value village, you know, a bunch of people who agree on the same principles, um, but aren't so homogenous that they look like you know are are robotically um, copies of each other. In some ways, um, that's kind of like the American dream, I guess. If you ignore you know all the bad stuff about the U.S., like that's the American yeah. dream, like this whole like the melting uh, pot plot idea uh, pot idea. And um, you know, Marx uh, he, and, and other humanitarians have pointed out um, that like a clan like community is necessary in society um, and religion for better or worse kind of fulfills that role in our society. So to, to start off just really, really basic. Um, do you think that human the human need for community is universal is it really something we need i mean i'm not an expert on on this i uh you know i'm sure there are psychologists or that that would be more of an expert to answer this question but um based on my own personal experience and my experience studying um spirituality and the anthropology of spirituality the the answer is a resounding yes I mean, there there are certainly individuals. I think that would they 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 say they're maybe content living alone in the forest, you know, foraging for mushrooms or whatever. But but um, but yes, I, I definitely think so. I think I agree too. I I struggle with this question because in general, yes, like uh, like people need other people. You know, I I think that's true. Uh, I actually did live in a in a van for a while and was very isolated. Uh, not quite living mm-hmm. off mushrooms. I had cans of beans in my van, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, you know, not living off much. And um, it, there was actually something kind of spiritual and healing about it. But but it always felt temporary. It always felt like I needed something to go back to eventually. Even the monks, you know, from the um, uh, the deserts of Nitria the early Christian monks and the like first um, second and third centuries. um, Then they all lived in caves in Egypt, but they lived in a community of caves. And even if when they were in, you know, periods of silence and they didn't speak to one another, one another, they were still together. And so I think that there is value, just like you just said, that, 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 being alone serves some really rich spiritual purposes. And, you know, you've got Jesus who was alone for the 40 days and 40 nights. And then Buddha has a similar story. And, um, but you're right. I I think for most people that's considered a temporary thing. Right. Especially, you know, for our modern context too, there's, there's honestly just too many people. It's pretty hard to, to, to isolate in any kind of healthy way. Um, so, so we probably have to live in community and it's probably not the worst thing for us. What do you think? This is just an opinion question. Um, what's a big, what's a bigger barrier in building a community? Generational gaps, political beliefs, or spiritual practices? Do I have to pick one of those three? You can talk to, about all three of them if you want. Uh, I just feel like those are the three classic ones that really stand in the way of, of good community. I mean, because to me, the root of that is not either of those three things. It's it's the heart of the human. And if the heart of the human is either hardened or fear-based then it won't matter if it's a generational issue, a political issue, a religious or spiritual issue. They'll, they'll find, they'll find an excuse to, to have discord, disconnect, fracture. Uh, The root problem to me is the heart of the, of the individual. I think you're actually nailing it because, uh, 
Yeah, it is fear, isn't it? Because in all three of those scenarios, it, it, it fear is the biggest factor, right? And um, and what's and what divides people. And I I think it's really interesting you bring that up because part of what I try to uh, talk about with cultish Christianity is they actually use fear to unite people, which is mm -hmm. um dangerous and bad. <laughs> and like the problem is when you make boogeyman's and and things to be afraid of, um, while you make might have a community that's all afraid of that uh it's a very limited type of community it's it's a very rigid kind of community that will eventually break down um one way or another i i think um so yeah i think you're i think you're absolutely right that fear might be uh the biggest barrier in building a community um and it and it's not necessarily generational gaps or or political beliefs or or even religion because people like to say religion is what divides us but probably a better approach to be like would be to to see what each religion is is afraid of so uh, that's really insightful those things are just the window dressings you know those are the the generational thing the political thing and all that those, that's just the that's just the dressing that's not the the being and i those those are our excuses. <laughs> you know, that's what we project outward so that we don't have to be honest with ourselves about what we're afraid of and um and that's why I'm very careful when I when I talk to people or I do interviews or whatever that to to qualify that I I am not anti-religion i'm anti-abuse of religion and more and even more broadly i'm just simply anti-abuse because i know many religious people who are some of the kindest most loving gracious people on the planet and uh and they call themselves a christian just like some other christians i know who are some of the most hateful people and um so that's why at the end of the day, for me, it boils down to a matter of the heart and whether or not one is choosing to align with love or with fear. Very, very well put. Couldn't put it better myself. I, I also make this qualification all the time because obviously I you know, have a book and a podcast that the title is rather inflammatory and I get that. <laughs> um, but, but truly, I mean, I, I, I still have Christian friends um, that I talk to. Um, and get along with and consider close friends. You know? um, granted, I will I will admit in the past like two years, a lot of my Christian friends have stopped being Christians. <laughs> um, but uh, I, but I, I agree with you. The thing I'm against is not Christianity, especially as you have as well. When you study Jesus, you're like Jesus is actually kind of cool. Like <laughs> it's it's shit, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's not a it's not an animosity towards um even even some of the history as messy as it is is kind of cool to look into and and some really cool wholesome things happened in in Christian history. Mm -hmm. But the 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 danger that I saw for myself and I and I feel compelled to warn others um about is specifically with evangelicalism is the one I harp, harp on the most. Um it can create abusers out of good people like um quickly and quicker than you realize sometimes um and it did it to me you know like i was a worse person when i was a christian and that was like easy to identify um yeah you know and and i think a lot of post-christians feel that way these days it's popular to talk about tribalism or it's technically neo-tribalism but it's shortened to tribalism um it's a sociological concept which postulates that human beings have evolved to live in a tribal society as opposed to a mass society. In fact, study various studies have um, concluded that humans can really only have the capacity to identify with or recognize or handle about 150 people. Like, that's kind of our cap. But most of us do have more followers and friends on social media than 150 and, and some of us go to church where there's more than 150 and some of us have jobs where there's more than 150. So um, we often find like smaller groups to identify with or at the very least, if we can't do that, we find simpler ideologies to subscribe to. Um, so do you think 
communities are always tribal in the sense that they need to be small or can we have any kind of large scale communities? Well, I, I, if there was ever a time in human history to test that, that question, it's right now, you know, we, we live in a global society with the information age and mass transit. Um, it's, we are literally exploring the answer to that question right now. And it's never been fully put to the test until now. So I, I don't, my belief about it versus what is or will be true about it are not necessarily the same thing. Cause I, I don't, I don't feel like I'm fully informed enough to know, but I, I do think, or what I'm, well, I'll put it this way. What I observe is both the growth of a global consciousness at the expense of greater polarization. So there are more and more people who are beginning to go, whoa, this whole thing about what the color of your skin, you know, makes us different um, is a misnomer. And we need to rethink this and restructure the way our systems are and how we understand each other and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so there's this, this breeding ground of this higher consciousness that's taking place. But at the same time, it's, it's, it seems to be at the expense or not at the expense of, but simultaneous to a polarization of an opposite perspective. It reminds me of, um, like, the centrifugal force, you know, when they take blood and they put it in a spinner and it separates the, what, the white blood cells from the red blood cells or something. That That's kind of what, that's what I'm observing anyway, is that on one hand, yes, there is a greater global community consciousness that is emerging, but at the same time, there are, out of fear, there are factions, whether it be culturally based or geopolitically based or religious based or whatever, that are digging their heels in deeper about how who they are and what they're about is better or different in a good, better way than others. Does that make sense? It does. I think that's. I think that's what all the experts say too <laughs> that I've read. So uh, you you can probably just call yourself an expert now if you're just saying what they say. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. Um, it is interesting, right? You know, it's people talk about this a lot with technology because technology simultaneously obviously means uh, instant global communication. Um, they talk about, you know, you invent the ship, you also invent the shipwreck, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, I like that. And so we're, we're living that out on one hand. Then we just had this uh, thing that I don't know if uh, podcast world will censor me or lower me. But that thing, the, 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 the thing that we all know that happened in 2020, <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the thing that, uh, that you have to wear a mask for, Um that really was an example of us not uh, of us having to be a community globally and really not having the capacity to. And, uh, and it's interesting because, you know, the, the pros and cons, right? Like if we did not have global mass communication and all this other stuff, you and I wouldn't even be having this conversation right now and it wouldn't be being recorded and any good that you and I might accomplish in this wouldn't happen. Um, but but the question still remains at what cost um, and uh we don't know we don't know what the cost is but we're all uh, again afraid and i think being afraid of all of this isn't really helping either cuz like you said fear doesn't fear can definitely be a community blocker too the reason i wanted to start there is because i want to talk about you know kind of religion versus spirituality some more but i think it's good to say well take religion and spirituality off the table is community communities hard either way. I think, I think it's just hard for humans to have true community. A am I right in that? Well, what, okay. So I, I'm a big, I, I, I probably would have made a good lawyer in the sense that I like to defer, define all of my terms. So what do you mean by true community? Yeah. So that idea of um, being united, but different individuals. So it's not like a, it's not a Nazi army, right? It's just uh, 
but still people with a common goal working to accomplish a common goal. So is, is that hard to do? I mean, is are we just bad? Or I, was it easier at a different time, or is it always been hard? Like, I I, I just feel like community. A lot. I, I'll, I'll, the question stems from. I'll hear sometimes people who are you know less serious about Christianity but still identify with Christians. It's like, well, I need that community. Like that's the thing they're worried they can't have without church. And mm-hmm. I'm wondering if they're actually afraid of something very legitimate, you know, because forming communities does seem to be very difficult. That's interesting. I I haven't quite thought of it from this perspective before, John. Uh, I appreciate you asking these questions because that's very, I mean, I, I, I definitely experienced it personally when I did in 2015, when I graduated with my master's degree and simultaneously realized that I have a theology degree and now am without question and none. (laughs) Um, I did suddenly feel the absence of, of not having a go-to quote community. But the truth of the matter was, even when I was going to the church I really wasn't that well connected to people on an intimate level. I taught a bunch of classes and a lot of people knew me and I helped lead some of the worship services, but uh, it wasn't deep, intimate connections with people. So it was almost like I kind of had a community, but not really. I don't know. And so I did feel an absence in my life at first, but then I after some time passed, I started realizing I need to pay attention to what's right in front of me. And somebody uh, said to me uh, around that time in my life, they said, bloom where you're planted. So I started looking around and I was like, well, what's going on where I work? How am I meaningfully connecting to the people who are right around me, right in front of me, the people I work for, the people who work for me, um, the members I serve, you know, whatever. And who are the people on my block where I live and how am I connecting meaningfully to them? And so I reframed how I understood what community was and where I should feel that sense of community. And that's one of the things that I really like to talk about as a non-religious um like a secular spiritual person um, is you don't need to go to some big building somewhere and sing a bunch of songs to a dude floating in the sky and tell him how great he is um, to have a sense of community. And that if you really, again, like you just said, you know, maybe they were afraid of something. Well, maybe it's because it's easier to go to a church and put all your energy out there somewhere thinking somebody up in the sky is going to give you a reward for it rather than to be able to face the person right across from you that lives next door. Yeah, I'm over I'm over here muted just saying preach preach snapping my fingers. Uh I 100% agree. Like th- that we we seem to not be able to recognize the humanity in someone across from us um when actually which I don't know if it's societal conditioning or what, but we're really uncomfortable doing that when I mean, it seems at least from an evolutionary standpoint that is how we're supposed to operate. The people around us are what the community we're supposed to find um Mm -hmm. but there's just been so much toxicity i think in our both religion and society that have made us really maybe overcomplicate the matter for ourselves i definitely think that's funny that you mentioned overcomplicating i was having a conversation with that with somebody earlier today about how what a complicated society we live in i mean you can't even you can't even call your internet service provider and get a straight answer. They're going to transfer you to like five different people, you know, before somebody maybe can help you. And it's, it's just, I was thinking, man, we, we've, we've, you know, there's been such advancement in technology, but at the same time, it's come with these layers and layers of complications. And it's, that has created barriers, I think, to people having just that genuine, I see the humanity in you 
and you see the humanity in me. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about humanity and religion and spirituality in light of all this, uh, you know, complication and also overcomplication regarding community. Um, so dictionary definitions, right? Religion can be generally defined as the belief in or worship of a superhuman controlling power, you know, something more than a human controlling. So uh, usually a personal God, but it could be multiple gods. Um it can uh, be more uh, specifically or academically referred to as just a system of faith and worship. Um, but spirituality is a much vaguer and um, term. It, it's typically understood as the quality of being concerned with the human spirit or soul, as opposed to just like material and physical things. Um, and the opposite of both of those ideologies would be something like secular materialism. Um, however, it's, it, it is probably best to view irreligious, spiritual, and religious as like three a three circle Venn diagram, right? <laughs> and everyone can kind of like plot themselves inside one or two of these circles, maybe all three somehow. Um, but what do you think the biggest difference between religion and spirituality is? Have you seen that meme that goes that, that I've seen it circulate in social media with the picture of a fish? in a fishbowl who that is submerged in the ocean. Oh yeah. 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 I have seen this meme. Yes. Yes. So that meme to me is, is a great illustration of the difference between religion and spirituality. You know, religion has limitations. It has a structure that you have to work within. Spirituality is the universal property that exists in all of life, like life itself. And religion is, is a bunch of, you know, structures and artifices that have been created uh, to try to explain or get to that space of spirituality. I I agree. I, would you? Can, I don't mean to be a, a d bag, but can I play devil's advocate just a little oh, please. bit? Please, no. Are you kidding? That's what conversations like this. Yeah. Okay. So I, 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 I really do agree with you, but but you could also say like you know rules or regulations or structure can be a route to freedom, right? Like you know, uh, like the people that I guess the classic example would be like traffic laws, right? It's like, well, what actually does provide more freedom, everyone driving wherever they want all the time, or having roads and signals and all the rest of this stuff? Could religion be doing that with spirituality? Could it actually be improving it with structure or or no? Well, so the the, it's not so much that religion is a it's I, I wasn't trying to suggest it's a bad thing um but i think it's almost like religion is like having your training wheels on your bicycle so that it can stabilize you and get you from point a to point b only to realize that eventually you don't need the training wheels and so, and, and that's, that, that's where, um, there, there are many different quotes in different traditions that, that point to this idea, you know, that, that religion can be like a support system for a person who is trying to evolve their, their spiritual self, but, when you really start to dig in deeply in the the spiritual traditions, and I've been greatly influenced by mystical traditions, which mysticism gets definitely misunderstood by a lot of people, particularly some of the rabid atheists. They don't understand what they don't understand, what that what it means. But but when you kind of get into this this mystical space of of uh it's not about the 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 rules and the structures it's it, it's how those rules and structures allow us to get to a different space that matter so and besides you know yes i agree traffic laws by all means are necessary but again it's it's 
true freedom is realizing that you don't like, I'm sorry that, that you're, we're, we're getting really deep here. So I'm, I'm having to, to really think through this. I, when I started thinking about where to have the greatest sense of freedom, it's not in the ability to do whatever I want. The greatest sense of freedom is the ability to say, I could do whatever I want, but I choose not to for whatever reason that, but that is better for me. I, I just want to, one of my favorite quotes is from Russell Brand, who says, um, we've been taught that freedom is the freedom to pursue our petty and trivial desires, but true freedom is freedom from our petty and trivial desires. Um, yes. I, I've not heard that quote, but go Russell Brand. Yeah. It's one of my favorites. Um, I a hundred percent agree. I, I, yeah, I and actually even when I was uh you know in Bible college we would talk about how um older <laughs> this is this is deep cut stuff but um you know uh older Christians who have been Christians for a long time talk about how oh I don't feel God's presence anymore. And the Christian rationale for it was because God doesn't need to be in your life so much. And, and it was very, it was very fascinating. I remember hearing that and being like, what? Because, you know, young evangelical studying to be a pastor. I'm like, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> but um, but the, it's, 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 it's common across many uh, religions talking about like, sometimes like you were saying, like religion can be a, a launching pad or training wheels, like a, a start to get you going. And in fact, I would not be, I don't think as, um, spiritually comfortable as i am these days without some of my uh religious studies um even even if even the problematic ones um really did lead me i think in a good direction but yeah so so i think i think you and i are in in pretty much 100 percent agreement that spirituality is the bigger category religion is much narrower um and that's but that doesn't necessarily make it bad but it does make it narrow it makes it what it is <laughs> which is a structure and the thing is, though, is that there are some religious people who understand that that religion uh, is the finger pointing to the moon, you know, so that if you understand that that this is something that is serving a practical purpose for you that brings you to this greater space, I think you can be both. You can be re religious and deeply spiritual. Um now, for the purposes of our discussion right now, as someone, I, I do consider myself secular, but I've been highly influenced by the experience of and the study of many different religions. And, um, but I came to a place where I define spirituality as simply being connected to something greater than yourself. And that can be interpreted differently by different people. You know, some people will, will still think of a concept like God. Other people think of, you know, the collective consciousness or, or even community, you know, for some really, for, for some people who are very uncomfortable with the notion of like God or something, the, the, the greater than themselves part is the community. Or maybe it's an ideal or something like that. And so for me, when I say I'm spiritual, it's just, I, I, it literally goes back to the root of the word. It means breath. Yeah, spiritus, the, the Latin word spiritus, uh, meaning breath. And so it's like, it's connecting to that source of life, whatever that is. That's the mystery, right? And even the most hardcore atheist scientist person has to admit that there is mystery at the end of the uh, of the rope and so being just connected to the source of life that 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 to me is what spirituality is all about awesome i agree and i'm always down for when somebody brings up uh latin or hebrew uh it makes my heart happy it makes me feel like i didn't waste thousands of dollars um so but yeah thanks for thanks for doing a, qu a quick version of the word study yeah it, in hebrew that's the case too the word for spirit its root um means breath so when god breathed into adam that was the idea breathe the spirit into him um yeah so let's let's take it a little different direction though because uh evangelicals can sometimes speak the same language you and I are speaking. Um, 
And evangelicalism has sometimes co-opted uh, the distinction between religion and spirituality to say Christianity isn't a relation, uh, isn't a religion, it's a relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, yeah. I've heard that. I've heard that quote from like dogmatic reformers, like really yeah. like academic, stuffy type Christians. And I've heard it from the progressive, non-denominational, sexy rock star Christians and everyone in between. I've heard that quote, you know, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. However, uh, all of them had, you know, specific doctrines about church attendance, preaching, sacraments, prayer, whatever it may be. Um, And so while they may want to emphasize a personal relationship with Jesus and their faith, they clearly don't want that relationship to be private or void of rules. So... As evangelicalism uh, continues to become wider and, in my opinion, shallower, um, but still very dogmatic, you know, is is it is it a religion or are they? Is it just a relationship? Or what do you think? Well, for one thing, I'm I'm quite certain that evangelicalism is actually starting to shrink, not not by huge measures, but there is starting to be a decline. Um at least from some of the studies I've more recently seen. Um, but I, I am a firm believer that the, that evangelicalism, so I'm speaking of it as a, as a concept or as a movement, but not about specific individuals, because I think there are some awesome individuals who've gotten swept up in it. But as a movement, I think evangelicalism is the contemporary version of who the Pharisees were in Jesus's day. The people who had gained the power and the control and who were basically legalist because, you know, just because evangelicals say they're not about legalism, they're all about legalism. (laughs) Are you kidding? I mean, they're the ones funding a lot of the laws that are being passed to, you know, restrict uh, people's rights with their own bodies and so forth. So, um, yeah, I'm not a fan of evangelicalism as a whole. Now, I, have I met some individual evangelicals who are innocent bystanders, more or less? Yes, but as a whole, not a fan. Yeah, and you are right that it's it's shrinking in um, identification. But I, what I'm scared about is um, what evangelicalism is able to do and has done for the past sixty or seventy years is they are very adaptable, um, and so I don't think they're going away anytime soon. Unfortunately, um, that's true because they have power. They have they they've merged with the political system in our country, and it's become all about power. So, uh, yes, yeah, in that sense, you're right. So, in numbers, they're shrinking, but in terms of their power, I I definitely agree with you. It, it's 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 a threat, and I live in Texas, so believe me, I am keenly aware of of how this merging of their ideology there firstly their ide listen this is all about power they won't admit it but it is and so religion is just the you know the flag they get to wave to to try to justify their horrific agenda uh to use an old a term you and i would have used unironically back in the day preaching to the choir um <laughs> but, uh yeah totally totally agree um it uh you know that's that's i i call evangelicalism uh the biggest cult in the united states um yeah i think and, yeah yeah and and you know my my three markers of a cult are always are they controlling are they containing and are they asking people to convert others those are usually the three markers of a cult in my eyes um and and they do so so but that is what's frustrating you know you brought up pharisees uh i've heard tons of sermons against pharisees from evangelicals um and so so there's almost like a cognitive dissonance thing that sometimes happens um it's very, very infuriating. 
But yeah, as far as I can tell, uh, religion is a much better term than any kind of relationship with divine being. I, d- I don't think I don't think evangelicalism can be defined as uh, as really any kind of spirituality. If I'm being completely honest, um, I agree. Yeah. So uh, great. It's always good to agree with somebody. It's also always fun to talk to uh, someone who's in the Bible Belt with me. That's always fun. Uh, I'm, a, I'm over here, here in Bible Georgia. Oh yeah, Atlanta, here. Georgia. Yep. Oh no way! Okay, I didn't yeah. realize you were over there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. Peace up, Aton down. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so one of the principles that is at least preached in Christian circles is the concept of uh, speaking truth in love. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and the verses they're quoting for from are uh, the Apostle Paul's letters to the Ephesians. Uh, I really don't feel like reading the scripture verse, but yeah, it basically says, "Speak the truth in love," uh, as we grow up in the way uh into him who is the head it's it, it's the idea and and it goes on to say speak the truth in love to make the body grow so that it builds everyone up in love um the the context is about community building that verse um and while evangelicals sometimes interpret this passage as uh permission for christians to be what they perceive as brutally honest um <laughs> that's not really what the phrase means uh speaking in the the truth and love more accurately meant um maturing right individually and communally uh not by being in denial um but the goal of speaking truth and love is is so a community could build around love is this a good concept um for creating community or or has the evangelical cults you know bastardized the phrase too much i uh, can can we can we gravitate towards this idea of speaking truth and love or do we need to come up with something new? The evangelicals have bastardized the entire Bible, but the Bible itself is a, can we say bad words on your podcast? Oh yeah. I, I bleep them out, but I think it's funny. So keep, keep, keep okay. on, keep it on. I say it's <laughs> the Bible itself is a clusterfuck. I mean, it, it really is in, I, I I describe the Bible in my book, but it's basically a beautiful mess. You know, there's there are, th- that's the problem. The evangelicals are pur- purporting a very simple approach to the Bible itself. And as a result, you end up with just a g- ginormous mess. And so um I don't think like this one, this one verse that you're referring to and this whole idea of bastardizing this one verse. I mean, that's, that's just, that's just the way they roll because it serves their agenda. Now, the problem is I think many of them cannot separate themselves enough to know what they're doing. Um, But the other problem is that the Bible is full of beautiful beautiful concepts that if understood through the lens of not legalism, but, but the spirit of it, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. And I I do think that it, it just depends on from what perspective you want to interpret the verse. And for me, I think that for myself and many people that I either know or I've connected with, through social me- social media, um, you know, we've been traumatized by Bible verses that I don't want to hear it from a Bible verse. So for me, the concept may may or may not have been intended by the author in the Bible, because the truth of the matter is we don't really know exactly what that person meant. We, we you cannot help but but project your own like worldview and, 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 and mentality when you read these ancient scripts. Right. And so part of what I'm advocating for as, as a nun in the 21st century is let's come up with some new illustrations, (laughs) some, some new phrases and, new analogies that speak to who we are today in a modern society so that we can know exactly what we're talking about. And we're not taking something written 2000 years ago and, and projecting our own meaning onto it. And so 
I'm kind of giving you a circular answer, I guess, to your question because it's complicated. You know, on one of the, on one hand, I do think it's very possible that the idea of speaking truth in love is is super important. For example, I would interpret that to say that, hey, evangelicals, out of love, I'm telling you guys that you are misappropriating your religion and the Bible to oppress other people for your own gain. And I would justify that by saying that's coming from a place of love because it's truth. But they would vehemently, of course, disagree with me. So I personally choose not to just, I I just don't get swept up in that kind of tit for tat with that group. I just, I'm trying to stay in my lane and stay clean in what, how I understand things. But I do think that the idea of speaking truth in love is, is important. And I think it can be a community builder if people really want to hear the truth and if their hearts are malleable to the truth and they want to orient toward love and not fear. Wow. I could not have answered that question any better. Good job. Um, yeah, it is. It's, it's, there's, there's all these little nuggets of wisdom in, in the Bible and a bunch of ancient texts and different religions, but it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's baby and bathwater and sometimes it's hard to tell which is which. Um, and, uh, yeah, for you and I, you know, we've probably had to answer this question in our own minds before, but, um, you know, maybe trying to think back to when we were first leaving, uh, our our respective cults. Um, when you when you first flee anything toxic, it can be therapeutic and sometimes necessary to like curse the source of your trauma and just let yourself be angry about your involvement or possible victimhood in an unhealthy dynamic. Um, but we don't want to get stuck there and and give our past experience um, so much power that it clouds or controls our current life. Um, but but how do we do that? How do we call out problematic systems without becoming so fixated on these issues that we neglect, you know, the rest of life? That's a great question because that kind of strikes at the heart of, you know, for example, if someone if if many countless people had not been brave enough to stand up against slavery in this cult, in this cult country, we you know, we'd probably still be doing it today. And so, or same thing for women's rights or whatever. I mean, there, some, there is a time and a place for radical action. Um, but at the same time, I think for your average person, the answer, uh, lies more in the idea that we have to simply, <laughs> to, to quote an overused, um, quote from Gandhi, we have to be the change, right? It was, wasn't it Gandhi that said that something along those lines? Yeah. And then Michael Jackson way later, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Okay. Let, we'll just, we'll just put Michael Jackson aside for now. Let's just, let's just focus on Gandhi. But, um, but, um, but, but, you know, just to be the change because not all of us can practically or realistically be these great social disruptors, but we can contribute in our own way, in the way we live daily. And so in the way that we live daily, like that's all I can manage right now. I'm a single mom. I've got three kids. I'm, I work, I've got a lot of responsibilities. I'm trying to slug it out there in the world. Right. And I, I don't have the bandwidth right now to go be, you know, this great social change champion, because I'm just, I'm just trying to deal with what I can realistically deal with, but I can be a a social change disruptor in the way I handle my life on a moment to moment basis or a daily basis. For me, I think that's where for most people, that's where the rubber hits the road. I agree. And I think I think the temptation, especially in like the social media age, is like, I just got to write the right post or listen to the right person or read the right book. And like, uh, and, and all that stuff is good, you know, like it's good to, to educate yourself. 
and to like want to fight and want to donate and do what you need to do for different social changes. But I agree that like sometimes we picture, you know, the MLKs, the Gandhis of the world and be like, that's what we need. And I'm like, well, if you study history, they 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 might have jump started something, but it takes a lot of people for social change to actually happen and not just mm-hmm. one person. So don't put the pressure on yourself to be one person changing things. I think you're right. In the way you interact with kids, you know, I'm a football coach and I'm passionate about mental health and suicide prevention. You know, the biggest work I do in suicide prevention is how I coach my kids at football. Um, yes. and, and that's how you have to perceive these things. So when we talk about the cults of Christianity, obviously, yeah, I've made a bit of a brand out of it. And like, I do my thing with the podcast, but that's not, um, I'm not expecting it to be a switch. You know, I'm expecting it to be maybe something that brings comfort to someone else or helps other people do this in their daily life. And most importantly, if I'm not doing it in my daily life, then I just need to stop doing this podcast. You know, the, the, the idea that you're getting at is so, so important. So thank you for saying that. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, towards wrapping up, uh, you know, one of the the fastest growing groups that we've been talking about is this idea of the nun, you know, um, when it comes to religious affili- affiliation. Um, but, you know, it's it's very difficult to avoid infiltration of various religious groups in our politics, our media, and even just our inner circles. So, you know, what does it look like when it comes to separating yourself from religious affiliation, but still having community, is there, do you have any principles for that? I certainly could use them because I still struggle with this. So finding community outside of religion and how to do it, is that basically what you're asking? Yeah. And, and probably, you know, mixed in there, like informed by the fact that you might be traumatized by like, (laughs) you know, having different communities or loss or grieving communities, you know, what, I, I just feel like it's really hard to hit that reset button. So I don't know if you have any advice for that. You know, it, it, I have thoughts about that in theory, but like I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, as a single mom uh, with three kids working, you know, it's, there are certain practical limitations that I personally experience that I I think would be probably indicative of many people. It's not so much that, that the potential for creating community isn't out there. It's that we are so hamstrung by some of the practical obligations of our lives these days. And, um, because if I had more time, I'd be more involved in like, volunteer work and, you know, civic things and cultural volunteerism and things like that. So I've had to reset my expectations because I think probably the, one of the biggest problems as it relates to community is not so much that we don't have a community. It's that we have an expectation in our mind of what it should look like. And then when we don't have what we think it should look like, that is when we're unhappy. It's the delta between the expectation and the reality. The larger the delta, the greater our unhappiness. So when we can close the gap on the delta between our expectation and our reality, then we have a greater chance of happiness. So for example, would I love to have, you know, 50 best friends that I know I can, I see every week and we go you know, have this shared experience together or whatever. I mean, that sounds good in theory, but that's not the way the practicality of my life is. So when I reframe, what is it that I realistically expect from my community, then I can find my happiness. So I find great satisfaction in the relationships that I build in my work or where I work out or in my neighborhood or going to my favorite restaurant and getting to, you know, know the people that work there when I go there once a week for pizza or whatever, you know, and, uh, or through like my kids' parents, they, they become a network of friends to me. And, and then I create occasions where I can have more meaningful interactions with these people, you know, whether I have people over for a little party or a dinner party or something, or, 
uh, the routine, the ritual of knowing that on this day, I get to see this person and I get to check in, in with this person. And that, that gives me that sense of community. I think, I think it's about reframing the way we think. And then that will allow us to find that sense of deeper satisfaction because meaningful human connection is possible just about everywhere. And at the end of the day, community is about meaningful human connection. Wow. I really don't want to add to that because I think that was so well said. Um, and I, I, I will try and like, kind of you know, add on that. Um, I think that's a really helpful point for those who maybe have left evangelicalism or are thinking about leaving it. One of the biggest problems you'll find in evangelicalism, I think, or at least that I found when I was part of it, is you are told a million different things your community is supposed to be. You are given so many different expectations that you're supposed to meet with your community and your community is supposed to do for you. And it's just a very inorganic way to understand life. So just just to add that to to say I 100% agree when leaving that that absence of, wait, aren't there supposed to be all these people doing all these things for each other? It's like, Maybe, maybe not. Like, take the time. Uh, are we are we currently in a moment of society where, you know, technology and a million other things are making our communities different and maybe worse? Probably. But that's not going to be helpful for your healing. <laughs> um, you just need to, 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 again, examine what your expectations are. And, and you might have some reasonable expectations, too. So don't just dismiss having any expectations. But it's a process figuring out what uh, you want from a community. And if you really do want that kind of community, there's nothing wrong with, with being a leader and trying to build it yourself in a, in a healthy way, I, w- I would say. Amen to that. That is so true. And that's somebody asked me that on a different interview that I did about along these lines about, um, you know, well, what do we do now that we left the church? Where do we find the community? Because I can't find it anywhere. And where do we go? And I, my answer was, well, do something about it. You know, like we have to, somebody had to be the first person to say, you know, I love break dancing on cardboard. And <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like somebody had to start something. And so it's like, whatever your thing is, whatever your jam is, be it, do it. And, and I do think that those of us now on this forefront of the movement of people saying, I can't do this anymore. I cannot inauthentically um, participate in this religious life that, that seems farcical to me. I really do think that as a generation, we are uh, shouldering a a great responsibility to usher in this new way of being. And with that comes a new way of understanding what community is and how we experience it. So amen to you. I totally agree. You got to be it. Do it. Awesome. Rachel, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, if people want to buy your book, how do they do that? It's on Amazon. All right. So uh, go ahead and give them the title or or if you have any kind of website or anything you want to want to sure. promote. It's. Sure. It's Confessions of an American Nun, N-O-N-E. And uh, again, my name is Rachel Roberts. It's available on Amazon. And you can also check out AmericanNun.com if you'd like. And if anybody would like to contact me, they can contact me at Rachel, R-A-C-H-E-L, Roberts at AmericanNun.com. Rachel, it's been an absolute blast. I'm so glad we made this happen. Thank you so much for coming on. And thank you, listener, for stopping by. If you wish to learn more about what's going on in my life or wish to purchase my book, go to thecultofchristianity.com. If you'd like to support this podcast, please continue to listen, follow, share, and consider subscribing for additional content. For only five bucks a month, you'll have access to two additional shows, Parsing Propaganda, where I review and critique Christian content, and Art, where we try some amateur religious trauma therapy. Every subscriber becomes a part of something bigger than this podcast as we endeavor to hold churches accountable, speak the truth boldly, and most importantly, love others despite our pain. 
Thank you for listening, and remember to keep love in your life, hope in your heart, and searching in your soul.